and it's the people of Kenya that we all, including yourself, Your Excellency, have taken oath of office to serve. As Parliament, we will play our role. We will pass laws that are pro-people, laws that will enhance the change that we desire and require in the country. As a parliament, we will help you to ensure that the resources that the people of Kenya place in the hands of the government through taxes are put to good use. And as a parliament, I'll encourage our members to ensure we present the people who elected you individually and collectively with vigor, with confidence, and with utmost effect. Your Excellency, in the last week, there was a minor standoff in this seminar because of the delayed disbursement of CDF. You as truly here came down, met the members, And we discussed very candidly, having engaged the executive back in Nairobi, and now the matter is behind us. We have a clear roadmap from the executive on how to disburse CDF timely so that members can be able to deal with the situations that require the use of those resources. We equally dealt with the issue of the Affirmative Action Fund for Women, called NGAF, and also the timely disbursement of those funds. The executive has done its bit last week, but much more will be done, I have no doubt, in ensuring that CDF and GAF are readily available to help the populace. What I want to assure you, honorable members, and this I speak with authority because we have consulted widely and deeply, is that CDF is here to stay. <laughs> and it's incumbent upon you as members of parliament to engage meaningfully and effectively to ensure that the irritations you keep get getting from vexatious litigants going to court on each and every issue at every twist and turn to frustrate the management of public resources that help the ordinary people must be put to rest by ring-fencing these funds in the Constitution. Because the bogey boy of the litigation is always the constitutionality of the funds. Make them constitutional beyond any reasonable doubt, and the vexatious litigants will be run out of business very quickly. <laughs> Thirdly, Your Excellency, this seminar is good and rich because for the first timers, they are going to be exposed to a lot of issues on what is expected of them. They have to learn on how to deal with budgets. They have to learn on the limits and extent of their privileges. They have to learn on how to be effective representatives. They have to learn on how to be effective oversighters of the executive. And above all, this is a mold that takes you to be great statesmen and women in our republic. And as I told you last week, noblesse oblige. Nobility carries obligations, nobility carries responsibility. So as members of parliament, we expect nothing less from you but conduct with extreme and absolutely admirable and unimpeachable decorum. Because you represent people, you carry their aspirations. So as your speaker, I want to encourage you, even when you want to actively disagree with an issue, 
It is demeaning and an affront to the title you carry for you to raise your voice unnecessarily and beyond reasonable, uh, reasonable measure. We can disagree in a very, very soft way. I always say you must choose to engage in megaphone diplomacy, and we shout at each other from the top of KICC, or we whisper into the right ears to get the right issues done. Both will give you the same effect, but the whispering will give you a better effect. I want to end, Your Excellency, by encouraging your government that these members of parliament are a resource for you. Your agenda will only get effect and meaning when it is turned into legislation. Any regulations from the executive take effect and meaning when they are approved by parliament. And as a parliament, we'll be able to work hand in hand to ensure that the people of Kenya get what they deserve, get what they need, and live an incrementally better life than the time you came into power. We as parliament have a cardinal duty to defend the constitution, to uphold the constitution, and we are going to do so without any fear or favor. Whatever you have sent to us to deal with is already before committees. Honorable members, as I finish, I have taken the extra step recently to put a team together because of the myriad of litigations that face Parliament on the most frivolous issues. I have brought together a team of senior lawyers in the House, Otenda Molo, Peter Kaluma, Murugara, John Makali, Wakili from Katanga, Osoro, and many others. And those who are not in the team, you may volunteer if you wish to join, so that you constantly deal with issues as they emerge so that we are not held back by decisions of courts because we are not representing ourselves well. We are going to make sure that we give those pro bono services. And those members have assured me, Your Excellency, they'll give pro bono services to ensure that they take head on and run out of town vexatious litigants as soon as is practically possible. It is now my humble pleasure, honorable members, and when His Excellency finishes addressing us, we are a bit too many probably to have a group picture. We probably will ask the leadership and our resource people, and of course the Prime Cabinet Secretary and uh, the Governor, to have a photo opportunity with the Head of State. And then His Excellency will join you for lunch. And those of you who have any stick issues, you know the President has been a member of Parliament. He was there before CDF, and he was there during CDF. He knows the difference between the two. So you actually are preaching to the converted. And when you preach to the converted, it may end up uh, spending our time badly because he knows exactly what CDF means. Your Excellency, it is now my humble pleasure to invite you to come and talk to these distinguished members of parliament of the 13th parliament. Thank you very much. Honorable members. <clears throat> um, Mr. Speaker, sir, <laughs> the Honorable Moses Masika Wetangula, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Mr. Stephen Twig, 
the leader of majority, uh, Kemani Ishungwa, Anthony, the leader of minority, Opio Andai, the whips, honorable members, good afternoon. Hamjambo. I am truly happy to be in your midst. And before I make my small remarks, let me first take this opportunity to congratulate each and every one member who has been elected to the 13th Parliament. <clears throat> Honorable members, I repeat to say congratulations because I am a practicing politician. I have been elected a few times and I know how difficult it is to persuade people to elect one. So I have tremendous respect for elected officials. Congratulations to all of you. Congratulations to those who earned the respect of their political parties to be nominated. And let me say from the onset that I look forward to working with all of you. I join you, honorable members, on this National Assembly Day at this event of tremendous importance as you undertake deliberations, reflections, consultations, and other discourses related to your mandate, which is essential to citizen well-being and our collective national progress. Since my last encounter with you, when I addressed the joint sitting of Parliament, significant developments have unfolded in our constantly evolving context. The role of the legislature has continued to assert itself in highly important, far-reaching ways. The need for a clear, rational, sustainable, and clear framework of engagement between the three arms of government has come out in very sharp focus. The National Assembly has, over the brief period, considered and passed legislative items that are critical for the nation, robustly vetted and approved various appointments of state officers, including cabinet secretaries, principal secretaries, and the inspector general of the police service. At the same time, you have concluded important internal agendas, including the formation of house committees, and it is my special honor to respectfully acknowledge the presence of the chairpersons and vice chairpersons who are in our midst. Pongezi Sana Waishimiwa for being given the mandate to run the affairs of the various committees of the House. I thank you, Mr. Speaker and honorable members for the priority you have accorded the government agenda in the House. As a result, we were able to expeditiously constitute the executive, conclude critical legislation, consider and approve various nominees for appointment to public office. The approval of the regulations which brought the Hustler Fund into operation, thereby realizing our financial inclusion agenda, is of particular historic significance. Similarly, the first legislation to receive my assent, the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission Act No. 1 of 2023, is designed to provide a framework for us with close parliamentary oversight to sustain the incremental perfection of our electoral regime. And in so doing, the National Assembly plays its part in setting the stage for us to deliver on our commitment to undertake a radical socioeconomic transformation with a view to uplifting Kenyans and all our people. I am therefore immensely privileged to have this singular opportunity to convey my gratitude to you in person and let you know that I do not take your consideration for agenda of the Kenya gov government for granted. 
Thank you very much. It is by working together in this spirit that we, as leaders, affirm the hope that Kenya's bright future can be guaranteed through dedicated service of our shared commitment. Mr. Speaker, I recently conveyed a list of additional names of persons whose suitability the House shall consider once it resumes. I request honorable members to perform their duty expeditiously to enable successful nominees assume their roles without delay. This is essential for our good governance. As set out in my address at the joint sitting of the House and reiterated in my memorandum to the Speaker, we see transparency and accountability as vital components of good governance, effective delivery, and the legitimacy of the executive. For this reason, the government is committed to the radical announcement of its accountability to the people of Kenya through their democratically elected representatives in parliament. In keeping with this commitment to enhancing government accountability, I have formally requested parliament to formulate within its procedures a mechanism for cabinet secretaries to appear before the House and give account to the people's representatives. I am steadfast in the conviction that articulating government policy and answering questions from the floor of the House is fundamental to the transparency and accountability of government. Properly effected, this framework will enhance parliamentary effectiveness by providing an optimal convergence of oversight and representation. It is important to emphasize, which I do, that the measure I request does not require any amendment to the Constitution and does, on the contrary, fulfill the threshold of accountability mandated by the Constitution. I therefore respectfully reiterate my request to Parliament and urge honourable members to move with speed in effecting the appropriate amendment of the standing orders once the House resumes, so that Article 1534B, that states that Cabinet Secretaries shall provide Parliament with full and regular reports concerning matters under their control, is actually effected. And with a, with a lot of respect, let me make this argument. Um, I was privileged to be part of the constitution-making process. And we had an opportunity to decide whether this country would go parliamentary or presidential. The people of Kenya decided unanimously that they wanted to elect their president. So we have crossed the Rubicon on matters, parliamentary or presidential. We've crossed that Rubicon. What we need to do is to refine the system of government that the people of Kenya decided, the presidential system, to refine it so that it is much more accountable. When I sent the request to parliament for you members, honorable members, to consider cabinet secretaries answering questions directly to members of parliament. It was not an issue of trying to renegotiate the constitution. It is an issue of accountability. I am a very strong believer that a government is as good as the accountability mechanism that has been put in place. All I am asking, all I am asking honorable members is for you to better, much more effectively, much more effic efficiently, to be able to discharge your responsibility of oversight over government. Ordinarily, an administration would be running away from that act. But I am presenting my government to you, honorable members, 
to oversight, to ask questions, to interrogate, so that we can have a better country for all of us. <laughs> to affirm that we are well and truly on a new trajectory in legislative management, I cannot fail to mention and commend the recent facilitation by the House of the work of majority and minority caucuses outside the scope of formal parliamentary business. I recently attended a meeting of the majority caucus and was able to observe and confirm the value of this new practice. It is a welcome innovation and I salute the imagination deployed by the House in achieving this outfit. I hope uh, Opio and I, you will also welcome me to the Minority Caucus, maybe to have a conversation. <laughs> I indicated at the onset that this event is critical and of fundamental importance. By design, Parliament is, is a consequential institution of state. A democratic government is underpinned by a representative assembly. The people who are sovereign speak to government on a continuous basis through parliament. Through their members of parliament, the people ask questions, find answers, audit the exercise of power and resources by their authorized officials, authorize the sharing of resources, interrogate, and moderate public policy. In our progressive democratic dispensation, the government is not feasible in any shape or form without a duly constituted parliament. It is clear that the robustness of our democracy, effectiveness of government, viability of the state, and the feasibility of development depend to a considerable extent to the existence and effective functioning of a strong parliament. The role of parliament, as set out in Article 94, outlines the fundamental scope of the institution. The role of the National Assembly, as set out in Article 95, goes further to establish the vital implications of this indispensable institution. Members of parliament are therefore state officers who individually and collectively perform duties and functions that go to the heart of governance and democracy. The Constitution has invested heavy demands upon your legislative oversight and representative roles. At the same time, it is most re remarkable that there exists no standard curriculum, education, or training institution to facilitate legislators in performing their functions. The principle of sovereignty of the people dictates that no barrier should fetter its full exercise and that whoever the people elect must be deemed fit for purpose and promptly thrown into the deep end of complex, diverse, often specialized uh, technical legislative activity with monumental national implications. I know from experience that how parliament fares collectively is a function of the capability and efforts of individual legislators. I also know that effective representation of our constituencies is highly challenging and that at all times we work under significant resource constraints. Nevertheless, members of parliament quickly adapt to the pace of national service at the parliamentary level by principally exercising an insatiable curiosity and also through peer learning. In this gathering, there exists precious nuggets of wisdom and invaluable learnings from the experience of colleagues who are sitting here, especially those who are ranking members. This post-election seminar is therefore particularly welcome since it 
provides a more structured forum for the exchange of insights, experiences, techniques, and contemporary knowledge on the conduct of parliamentary affairs. I have noted that your engagements will cover such critical matters as parliamentary procedures, budgeting, as well as powers and privileges. These go to the heart of your role as parliamentarians and will simultaneously fulfill the functions of a welcome new learning for debunked members and a timely refresher course for the veterans. Equally important, this seminar is an opportunity to forge useful networks with colleagues as well as distinguished guests who are present here, including the gentlemen from Commonwealth who are visiting from various other jurisdictions. By design, our parliament represents the face of Kenya. Its diversity is unrivaled as a perennial feature of the institution. Every portion of Kenya, as well as every community, belief, shade of opinion, and occupation are represented. The representatives themselves are equally diverse, with members hailing from innumerable professional backgrounds and walks of life. Among our members of parliament are lawyers, doctors, engineers, including Sudi, hospitality professionals, <laughs> teachers, former military and police personnel, administrators, trade unionists, and businessmen in various networks and sectors. Yeah, somebody introduced to me Sudi as engineer Sudi, so I was just... <laughs> I celebrate this diversity and encourage you as leaders to embrace it as a platform to champion a Kenya that is strong and united, yet proudly diverse and inclusive. We must be more intentional in order to make this tremendous endowment count for the betterment of our nation. I am further encouraged to witness the fact that your appetite for diversity is not restricted to our local situation. You have partnered with the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association to host this seminar and brought on board facilitators from South Africa, the United Kingdom, Australia and Canada, as well as the United States of America through the good offices of the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute. The objectives of this seminar are aligned with long-standing collaboration between Kenya and the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, as well as the agenda for the development of parliamentary democracy that we share throughout the Commonwealth family. Mr. Speaker, one outcome I look forward to with great anticipation is the emergence of a robust ethos of strong individual and collective parliamentary performance is cognizant that Parliament, the National Executive, and the Judiciary are ultimately arms of one government. Let me repeat that. One outcome that I look forward to with great anticipation is the emergence of a robust ethos of strong individual and collective parliamentary performance that is cognizant that Parliament, the National Executive, and the Judiciary are ultimately arms of one government. It is essential that we make significant progress in building a constructive synergy among the arms of government, which scrupulously observes constitutional boundaries, checks, and balances. At the same time, we must be capable of coordinating effectively towards the realization of our shared aspiration, the well-being of every citizen and their socioeconomic uplift through a radical transformation governance and in our economy. In order to achieve effective synergy between the arms of government, I have assigned the Prime Cabinet Secretary, the Honorable Musalia Mudavadi, the role of coordinating and liaising with Parliament on the legislative agenda of government. 
And I have done so realizing the importance of there being a firm, definite link between the executive and parliament that facilitates the work of parliament, especially on requests from the executive. I have also assigned the Honorable Attorney General, Honorable Justin Muturi, the counterpart liaison role with the judiciary. I hope, dear Honorable Members, that you see, as I do, a collaborative framework along these lines is a viable means of deploying our leadership capabilities to address the issues that matter to Kenyans. It is in this spirit of effective coordination and constructive synergy that I wish to address the matter of dispute management. We are a proudly diverse but inclusive democracy. Parliament represents every shade of opinion in Kenya. Differences, disagreements, and divergent standpoints are inevitable. Something would be terribly wrong if we agreed all the time on everything. How we handle disagreement goes a long way to demonstrate our grasp of the parliamentary mandate. The name parliament originates from an old French word for speaking. Parliament is the national forum where the people, through their representatives, reason together on a continuous basis. Speaking with each other is the essence of the institution. Through debate, consultation, and negotiation over every matter until an acceptable position is reached. Parliament is not a place for picketing or heckling or holding demonstrations or holding other institutions at ransom. I must respectfully observe that the emerging practice of litigating disagreements through the courts not only contradicts the essential purpose of parliamentary institutions, it demonstrates the failure of parliament at the level of institution and at the member level. The people elected members of the National Assembly to perform their work through parliament, not the judiciary. If the people had wanted their representatives to litigate their matters in the courts, the Constitution would have provided for the elections of magistrates or judges not parliamentarians. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is the following, that uh, we have, there will always be issues, and I want to encourage the leadership of parliament and the collective body of members of parliament, both in the National Assembly and in the Senate, that we cannot continue to take our disagreements to the judiciary. If anything, we are surrendering the legitimacy of the houses to the judiciary. And the only beneficiaries of these litigations are those people the speaker was talking about. The vexatious litigants are the only beneficiaries. And of course, the good people uh, I do not want to run into trouble with lawyers, <laughs> but they are the only other beneficiaries of those uh, litigations. So I, I really encourage Parliament, if Parliament actually has the power to constitute itself into a court, how does one court take another court to court? <laughs> you know, it, it really must be something that Parliament must really think about. And... Uh, members from across the divide should be able to provide leadership in a manner that we can be able to create consensus on issues that affect the Houses of Parliament. It is time for the leadership of Parliament in both Houses and at the majority and minority parties to take a clear stand on this matter and decisively move to discourage the prosecution of parliamentary business in courts. 
there are some courses of action which automatically fall off our set of strategic options once we properly internalize our purpose, role, and function. For parliamentarians, cost litigation is such a cause of action. Let us resolve our issues within Parliament. As earlier observed, the National Assembly is essential to the proper functioning of government and the achievements of development aspirations. It holds immense power with fundamental implications or every dimension of national endeavor. This power, however, must be exercised with prudence, restraint, and a strong sense of sustainability, especially as pertains to matters budgeting. I agree entirely that we must cut the cloth that fits us. We cannot continuously to have an, we cannot continuously have an oversized budget and imagine that there will be some miracles that will happen. When I came into office, we had a budget that we needed to borrow 900 billion. And I thought that was reckless and irresponsible. I cut it down to 600 billion. I will be presenting shortly our revised budget that will actualize that commitment that I made to the country. The context of national budgetary decision making, balancing limited resources against the demanding needs for equitable allocation and avoidable obligations makes hard and unpopular decisions inevitable. The scope of our budgetary ambitions is firmly dictated by our ability to finance it through available revenue raising measures. Service delivery depends on appropriation of available resources, and it is quite clear that not every item we deem urgent and necessary will be financed. And when I say available revenue raising measures, I mean that each and every one of us, once we agree on a tax regime, each and every one of us must pay their part of taxes. We cannot continue to operate in a space where those in power exempt themselves from paying taxes using all manner of instruments, while those who do not have as much power pay tax. All I am saying is that the good people who are used to exempting themselves from paying tax, their day is up. Every citizen must pay tax. That's all I am saying. And it doesn't matter. Even if they sponsor demonstrations so that they don't pay tax, I want to promise them they will pay tax. There's no more exemption. This country is not the animal farm, where some are more equal than others. We are going to have a society where every citizen carries a, a fair share of our burden to raise uh, taxes. I am not talking about additional taxes. I am talking about taxes that have been agreed upon by parliament and signed into law. We must therefore be especially prudent, by which, mean, by which I mean that it is our duty to avoid increase in budgetary allocations regardless of financing capacity and to endeavor at all times to use our offices as servants of the people to ensure that government lives within its means. And that is a collective responsibility, both by the executive and by the legislature, that we ensure that our budget-making process is aligned 
to the resources that we have. This calls for us to bring back our expenditures within sustainable limits. Our recurrent expenditure currently outstrips revenue collection. You will recall that in our last interaction, I directed the National Treasury to reduce budgetary allocation, as I said, in this year's budget by about 300 billion. The reductions are going to be included in the supplementary budget for your consideration once the House resumes. And I am counting on your understanding and leadership to minimize non-essential expenditure. As pertains the NGCDF, you don't need to convince me about the importance of decentralized funds in meeting the everyday needs of ordinary citizens at the grassroots. I was a member of parliament when there was no CDF. I was a member of parliament when we introduced CDF. I know the difference. It is like day and night. I understand the pressure that you are under in regard to this matter, and I am also aware that the National Treasury has communicated its commitment to a disbursement schedule that is realistically aligned to revenue projections and actual collections. I therefore ask you to be understanding and to work with what is actually possible. And I will be as candid as I can be so that um, we don't overpromise and we don't underdeliver. I reiterate that we must take a stand and play our part in enhancing budgetary sustainability and minimize fiscal risks by aligning our demands with the best budgeting principles within the limits of our budget policy. Due to the prevailing drought, our people are undergoing food stress. We are taking measures to alleviate the situation by distributing basic food supplies to the most vulnerable in affected populations. It is our plan to support our farmers through provision of adequate farm inputs, including affordable fertilizer, mechanization, technical and extension services, as a key priority. And let me say, it is true, we have a serious situation of cost of living. We didn't get here overnight. We got here because of a series of decisions that were not made in the right direction. We will not get out of it by magic. We will get out of it by clear plans, interventions. And I want to promise you, members, that we have already registered five million farmers across the country. We intend to work with our farmers to grow our food so that we do not become slaves of imports from other countries when we have farmers who can do this for us. All the farmers are asking is to work with government to ensure that they can produce food for our nation. I know that the National Assembly has and will continue to receive reports detailing the manner and extent of environmental harm occasioned in various parts of the country through various reckless and illegal acts. Deforestation and pollution are among the leading practices. I recently launched a national tree planting program aimed at growing at least 15 billion trees by the year 2032. I urge you to join the movement to Green Kenya by leading tree planting campaigns in your constituencies. Additionally, I encourage you to be mindful of the imperative to prioritize the conservation of wetlands and inland water bodies, including rivers and swamps, which are critical for our water needs. I have been greatly encouraged to note your strong participation in regional and Pan-African forums. This is an aspect of your activity that deserves greater focus as an integral part of your functions. The starting point is to arrive at an understanding and articulation of the East African community and other regional frameworks as platforms for us to enrich our sovereignty by projecting 
our national values, and embracing our brothers and sisters throughout our region and continent into networks of collaboration and cooperation for mutual benefit. It is your various interparliamentary encounters, therefore, that will make our values visible as an integral part of our national brand and extend our networks of solidarity and goodwill across our region. As I conclude, I wish to reiterate the Government of Kenya's commitment to sustain a high level of effective, impactful, and transformational engagement with Parliament since this is key to the achievement of our vision for Kenya. To underscore the seriousness of this commitment, I have designated a principal secretary solely responsible for parliamentary affairs under the Prime Cabinet Secretary liaison and coordination function. And I'm sure the Honorable Musalia Mudavadi will be speaking to you later. I intend to honor your invitation to forums like this in furtherance of our intention to enhance synergy among arms of government in order to deliver a more and a better Kenya within a short time. And let me commit uh, to this August gathering that um, we will continue to explore avenues of building synergy between what you do and what the executive is doing. And I have no intention whatsoever to compromise the overs oversight role or the independence of Parliament. Parliament must always defend its independence and must always act independently as is required by the Constitution, as we do in the executive and as we do and as the, as the judiciary does, all understanding that we serve the same people, but we have to do so from different uh, platforms. It is now my pleasant duty, honorable members, to declare this seminar officially open. I wish you very fruitful deliberation. May the good Lord bless you. Asante.